This story does not have a happy ending. It's the story of a national park that died, of a park we can no longer visit, of a park whose resources were gone before we could even see them, of a park that was stolen to death, of a park that no longer exists. This is the story of a park lost to time, of Fossil Cycad National Monument. The tragic fate of Fossil Cycad National Monument is, as I said, a sad story. You could drive right through the middle of it today on a two-lane highway and never know that there used to be a national park there. That it used to be one of the most important fossil areas in the United States. But the story of Fossil Cycad is also a cautionary tale of what can happen to a park when we fail to protect our most valuable resources. Resources that will never come back, at least not in our lifetimes. This story was suggested to me by Alex Conrad 2904, who wrote in about now defunct national parks. And honestly, I'm going to have to go back to the well on this comment because there's lots of good stories here. Their suggestion for Fossil Cycad stood out to me because unlike some now defunct parks, which were either absorbed into other parks or maybe just didn't fit the bill for park designation, Fossil Cycad National Monument has the dubious distinction of being deauthorized because it failed to contain any of the resources it was tasked with protecting in the first place. We're going to get into it, but just a reminder that if you enjoy national parks, public lands, protected places, and you want to see engaging educational stories about them, to please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell thing too so YouTube lets you know that I actually exist. You can follow me on Instagram, that's where I'm most active and it's where it's easiest to communicate with me. And if you are an especially kind and generous soul who has the financial capacity to do so, you can support me on Patreon, where you can join my Discord and get up to three extra videos per month. All right. Enough with the pleasantries, let's talk about the death of a national park. So this story begins in the late 1800s. If you'll recall from other videos that this is kind of the time in US history where the conservation movement is starting to pick up steam. We've established a few national parks by this point, people and elected officials are starting to come around on the idea that it is beneficial for society as a whole to set aside certain places of particular scenic, scientific, or recreational value. That's the scene when, in the 1890s, reports start coming in about these strange fossils being found in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Local ranchers are calling them prehistoric pineapples and selling them as trinkets and curios. This gets the attention of many a fossil collector, among them Smithsonian paleobotanist Lester Ward and Yale paleontologist O.C. Marsh. They start acquiring many of the fossil specimens that the locals have collected and determine that these strange fossilized plants are cycads. Now, let's take a quick pause right here because I can see some of you furiously typing away as we speak that actually those are not cycads, and that is correct. The fossil cycads of what would become Fossil Cycad National Monument are not actually cycads. The name was a misnomer. They are what are known as cycadioids or binitatales, which are related but very distinct relatives of cycads. The lineage is extinct now, but scientists think they could hold important clues to understanding the evolution of flowering plants. I don't want to get too deep into this, but cycads are what are called gymnosperms, and along with things like conifers, just kind of have their seeds exposed to the air, usually as part of a cone, think like pine trees. This is in contrast to what are known as angiosperms, or flowering plants, which enclose their seeds in fruits, which develop from flowers, hence flowering plants. It's like way too deep to get into here, but the point is, these cycadioids, the ones at the center of our story, don't quite have flowers, but they don't quite have cones either. They're somewhere in between, and they have more complex reproductive structures than cycads, hence the whole evolutionary link thing. That's why they're important. They fill in a gap in the fossil record that we 
didn't really know much about at the time. And Ward, the Smithsonian guy, knows this and is like, we gotta study these things. Marsh, you know anybody who wants to go dig in the dirt and study old plants? And Marsh is like, yeah, I got just the guy, young buck here by the name of George Wheeland. And oh boy, George Wheeland is something else. He's kind of like the protagonist and the antagonist of our story. Anyway, he gets out there to South Dakota and basically falls head over heels for these fossilized cycadioids. He becomes the world's foremost expert on these things, writes two whole books about them, and collects a ton of specimens, most of which end up back at Yale University. He also becomes a big advocate for their protection. He doesn't want them to fall into quote unquote unworthy hands, whatever that means. He's so worried about this possibility that he takes advantage of the homesteading laws available to him and buys 320 acres on his own dime in and around the area of the fossil cycadioids. He plans to donate the land to the federal government as a national monument so that this place, one of the largest and most important concentrations of fossilized plants in the United States, will remain protected. For future generations to enjoy. Feds are like, cool, you want to donate the land? We don't have to pay for it? Sounds good. We just need to check and make sure this is like worthy of protection. Basically, they just want to make sure it holds up to the standards of being protected by the National Park Service. So they get a geologist from the US Geological Survey by the name of Charles Walcott to write up a report. He doesn't actually visit the site and actually receives reports that, in fact, there are no fossil cycads left at the site, but says, quote, in the future, more specimens will be exposed by erosion. And at that time, it would be well for the area to be under the jurisdiction of the government, end quote. This is red flag number one, but nonetheless, Interior signs off and on October 21st, 1922, Good old Warren Harding establishes Fossil Cycad National Monument under the authority of the Antiquities Act, which I also have an explainer on if you're interested. From here, things only get more strange though. Fossil Cycad National Monument was placed under the administration of the nearby Wind Cave National Park, but was given no additional funding or staffing to administer the famous fossil beds. Instead, day-to-day -day operations were overseen by local ranchers because everybody knows that the same people who were selling these fossils for profit are uniquely qualified to now oversee their protection. I will say, there is no evidence or reports of any thievery during this time that I could find, but the circumstances are not great, so do with that information what you will. So anyway, Fossil Cycad National Monument is essentially left by the wayside. It's neglected and mismanaged and is pretty much an afterthought. The superintendent of Wind Cave, remember he was overseeing it, didn't even mention it in his annual report until 1933, 11 years after it was established. They first official visit from the National Park Service came in 1929 by Roger Toll, the superintendent of Yellowstone. He was less than impressed, stating, quote, all available specimens have been picked up and there is nothing left that is of interest to visitors, end quote. He continued, quote, so far as I can find out, the fossil Cycad National Monument has nothing to protect and perhaps no bed of fossils. If it has no value, present or future, it is a liability, not an asset to the rest of the system. Unless Professor Wheeland or someone can furnish information indicating some purpose to be served by the area, it would seem to be desirable to discontinue it as a national monument." End quote. Red flag number two. But speaking of Professor Wheeland, yeah, let's, let's get back to him. By all accounts, he genuinely cared about these fossils and fought tooth and nail for their protection, and even answered the call of Roger Toll by leading a CCC excavation in 1935 to uncover more fossils, which was fantastically successful. They found over a ton of material, but that material inextricably found its way from Fossil Cycad National Monument to Wind Cave National Park and eventually ended up at Yale University, like much of the fossil cycads found earlier. In fact, Whelan later revealed that he had removed thousands of fossil cycads from the area before it ever became Fossil Cycad National Monument. This would have been red flag number zero, I guess. By some accounts, he had removed the most fossils of anyone. We now know that, in all probability, all of the fossil cycads on the surface at Fossil Cycad National Monument were removed before it was even established. 
most of them by the man who fought so hard to protect them in the first place. With no cycads to speak of at Fossil Cycad National Monument, it never became a priority for the National Park Service. Wieland, for his part, advocated for a large museum to display the fossils at the monument, but the Park Service couldn't justify the cost for a park that didn't contain its namesake resource. It floundered for a few years more until on September 1st, 1957, Fossil Cycad National Monument was deauthorized as a unit of the national park system. It never developed any visitor facilities. It never opened to the public. It never had any fossil cycads. Since then, it's been managed by the BLM. In 1980, during a road construction project, several more fossil cycads were excavated, but they too disappeared. And that's the story of the death of a national park. In researching this episode, I've learned of the efforts of a couple of very dedicated MPS researchers, namely Vincent Santucci and John Gist, who have fought very hard to preserve the memory of fossil cycad. Their motto is lost but not forgotten. And I hope that this video, in some small way, contributes to their mission of keeping the story of fossil cycad alive along with its implications. Fossil cycad is a tragic tale, but it's a cautionary one as well. I mean, parks like Petrified Forest are still dealing with fossil theft today. Just goes to show that we can't take these places for granted, not for a single day. We have to learn from places like Fossil Cycad and fight for them and advocate for them and tell their stories and make sure that things like this never happen again. That's what I'm trying to do here. And if you'd like to see more stories like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell thing. Follow me on Instagram and check out my Patreon. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.